Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai harumai and welcome to tonight's live stream Kōrero Arts and Climate Innovation. Ko te lene wihi peihana tōku ingoa he uri ahau nō Ngāti tu Kōrehi me Ngāti Raukawa, engari i tipu ake ahau kei Kemuriti. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to this event brought to you by Track Zero Pans and Auckland Live. Our topic for discussion this evening is climate change or culture change. And I'll begin our session this evening with the karakia, me karakia tato. Tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai te mauri tu, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumie, huie, I'm very pleased to introduce my co-chair for this evening, Sarah Meads from Track Zero. Kia ora, Sarah. Kia ora and a big welcome to those of you watching live on Facebook and YouTube. And thanks for those who might tune in later to the recorded live stream. We hope you're keeping well in level two and a half and two across New Zealand. Arts and Climate Innovation is a series of non-partisan live stream kōrero bringing together speakers from sciences, arts and creative and cultural communities to hear their perspectives on the powerful role arts can play in shaping a fair carbon neutral future. This is our fourth episode in a series of six happening every Wednesday at seven o'clock. In tonight's panel, we'll discuss why climate change is seen as a cultural issue and that we need to deeply change our values and behavior rather than changing the climate itself. Exploring how our identity, norms and values are expressed through arts and culture and how they're a vital part of shaping a transformative change in our climate response. Sharing their thoughts and insights this evening are script writer, poet, broadcaster and podcast producer, Linda Chanwai Earl, musician, composer and senior lecturer in composition and performance at Massey University, Warren Maxwell, visual artist, curator, researcher and head of school at Fiti Orihua School of Art at Massey University, Dr. Huhana Smith, and musician and composer Rob Ruha. Thank you again for joining us tonight. If you'd like to join in the conversation, please don't hesitate to send in a question or a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Just drop your thoughts or comments or questions in the comments box in Facebook and YouTube, and we'll collect those for you and ask our panelists. Our first panelist is Warren Maxwell. And Warren has been a professional working musician and composer for over two decades in bands such as Southside of Bombay, Trinity Roots, Little Bushman and X Fat Freddy's Drop. He's senior lecturer in composition and performance at Massey University. And in 2016 was inducted into the Institute's prestigious Hall of Fame. In 2016, he was also invited to Antarctica as part of Antarctica New Zealand's Artist Community Outreach Program. Since then, Warren has been focusing his composition and research around environmental connections and the Anthropocene. He was commissioned to compose the opening of the 2018 Arts Festival in Wellington to celebrate the traditional seafaring navigation knowledge Mataranga Māori. The work recently won Best Arts or Cultural Event in the New Zealand Events Awards. Welcome, Warren. Uh, kia ora Sarah, kia ora uh, kia ora uh, really awesome to see you all and um, you know thank you for inviting me to this uh, you know to this court at all. Uh, Delina, thank you, thank you for being our facilitator, uh, Delina okay. Sarah tonight. So yeah, so uh, a real privilege to to um, have the space and be invited to court at all like um, as you mentioned Sarah, um, going down and being invited down to Antarctica was really the catalyst for me. It was it was that that, that enlightening kind of eureka moment. It's like, ah, oh, this is what I've been, you know, looking for. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I've been involved in the music industry for, yeah, 20 odd years since the early 90s. I graduated from the jazz school in Wellington here. And, um, you know, went out into the uh, music industry, bright eye, bushy tail, and, and um, um, formed Trinity Roots and um, joined up with Fat Freddy's Drop. And um, that's been an amazing experience, you know, and with Little Bushman, lots of different bands. Um, and, I, and if I think about, I've been thinking about tonight's chord at all, and, and a lot of 
a lot of my compositions and a lot of our work have really been around love and politics. <laughs> you know, if I were to put an umbrella over it, and and those two, you know, I guess they underpin everything that I've been been doing. When you think about Aroha and the connection of Aroha to everything, and then the when we're talking about the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene, the, the political nature of that. So, um, yeah, I've been weaving those together, but my, that trip down to Antarctica really um, was a catalyst to get me closer to um, understanding and reconnecting myself back to uh, to Taiao, the natural world. You know, being, um, I don't know, I grew up in a, in a, um, a family that was very outdoors orientated. My dad loved hunting and you know fishing, camping. We we always were out outdoors, doing that kind of those activities. You know, um, we didn't have a TV for a long time. Music was our entertainment. So we had. I feel very fortunate that we had those things as a kōrowai around our 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 upbringing. Um, you know, being outside, uh, being in nature, uh, and then music being woven around that although I didn't understand it at the time but I feel like that's a, that's been a huge part of my whakapapa uh it's been music and te taiao. uh however it only took me it took me that trip down to Antarctica that privileged uh trip down there to I just you know that that light bulb moment that connection and so um I've been a little bit obsessed with Waddell Seals for the last four years, ehu hana. I think I've, I've sort of, <laughs> uh, I think, um, you know, anyone in the music community now, whenever I meet them, I, you know, catch up with them. I'm sure I've played our seals to you, Rob, a few times. Um, I've taken them into nightclubs and said, hey guys, you guys should play this new sound. And it's these Waddell seals from underneath the, the Ross Sea. Um, but it made me realize that Papa Tuanuku and, and our, you know, Mother, Mother Nature was the original muse of all of our ancestors, all cultures, you know, Maidano, way back, if we think way back. Um, our own Tonga Puro specialist, you know, we're, we're, Tonga Puro is there to, um, like, as a, as a conduit between uh, nature and, and our stories, hey, and the, and the our Māori. So, yeah, it was that Antarctica, Antarctica trip, then Waddell Seals. I've got seven hours. If anyone wants to listen to seven hours of Waddell Seals underneath the Ross Sea, just send me your email and I'll flick it to you. It's a, it's a really good remix. Um, so, so since that trip, it's made me, uh, it really revitalized my own work. You know, I, in all honesty, I was feeling a little bit stale with what I had been producing and wanted a change. And this was such a revelation for me and, and uh, inspiring. So even today, I was up in uh, the Nahiri up here uh, at Paitu Mokai, Featherston, uh, and out at the lake, I try and get out to Wairarapa Moana as much as possible. So um, with this new sort of um, found kind of direction uh, with my music practice, composition, production, um, I've really been connecting locally with uh, hapu and iwi out here and because we're right beside Wairarapa Moana there's just a huge karanga I don't know there's a there's an unseen kind of modi here that just by living here you cannot help but feel it so we've got Rimutaka Maunga we've got Pai Maunga Tararua you know just over the hill from from you guys Huhana uh, and Emily um, but being so closely situated next to these beautiful maunga, this beautiful forest, and this moana that needs a lot of help, uh, you, you, you just feel compelled to, you just want to contribute some way. So um, my practice has taken a, a shift uh, into being more, more community, locally focused. Um, you know, we've all heard the sayings, especially in terms of music industry is all about getting Spotify likes and you know numbers and likes and sales. Uh, I've sort of just put that to the side for now. And um, the, the phrase used to be, uh, think globally, act locally. 
But um, it, for, for me personally, it's actually about thinking locally, focusing locally and, and rippling out from there. And I think if we, you know, can adopt that model, we connect this hapu with, or this group with what the group 10Ks down the road is doing with what the group down in, in Lake Ferry is doing with what the group over in Kohanui are doing with what, you know, and all of our ripples then combine. So um, that seems to be the, a, a huge focus out here. Uh, Wairarapa Upamwana has just had uh, international Ramsar status uh, announced by uh, Minister Eugenie Sage uh, two weeks ago. So that's just been massive for us, massive, massive. Um, you know, they've thrown a, uh, quite a lot of resources at the protection and the revitalization of, of White Upper Moana now. Um, so, yeah, it feels like all of the communities around the Moana out here are, are suddenly, you know, the, 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 the switch has just flicked on. And even though, I mean, there have been a lot of people doing a lot of work, uh, fight to a work around the Moana and out here, all the water catchments have been doing a lot, a lot of work for a long time. And I just want to make it to Kia Koutou, Kia Rato, if you're watching. Um, so, yeah, this feels like another pivotal point for the Wairarapa, for South Wairarapa, uh, for the Moana. And, and um, going down to um, Antarctica again, um, and I went down with a colleague of, of ours, uh, Jason O'Hara, who's a design visual story, digital storyteller. And something that he sort of conceptualized is down there in Scott Base, you know, you're separated from, um, from the ice, from Te Taiao, by like a six inch uh, piece of polystyrene, basically, from the shipping containers, you know. And it, Without sounding cheesy or cliche, I mean, it is the kind of environment where if you walk outside at the wrong time without all of your gear, you know, some really terrible things could happen. And it just having that in the back of your mind makes you realize that, um, you know, we are that far down there. We are six inches away from actually reconnecting with, with Mother Nature. And she can be harsh, but, but that's the cycle of things, isn't it? It's just, you know, the cycle of things the highs, the lows. So that was a really um, uh, enlightening moment as well. Uh, and it was a connecting moment, realizing that we're just that far away from, you know, life or death. I went out one day without my gloves uh, and it was a beautiful sunny day. And I swear within five minutes, my fingertips just started to burn, you know, and I ended up borrowing Jason's gloves. I was like, oh, you know, outside like trying to keep warm, but, um, <clears throat> But it's kind of one of those kick up the backside moments as well, you know. It's like, you know, mankind, I think we, we've been a bit arrogant. And uh, you can't do that down there. So, um, yeah, and, and, and it's, if, to me, it actually, we can't be arrogant anywhere. You know, we can't be controlling. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my work now. I'm, I'm really quite obsessed in, in weaving um, I guess I, I can only speak for myself as weaving myself back to Te Taiao and, and making, a, um, making that a big part of my, my journey and a privileged part, you know, of it, yeah. So that, that, that'll do me for now. I'm sure I'll butt in somewhere, but um, ka nui te mihi ki o koutou. Not a word. Let's Thank jam. you so much. Thank Cheer you. Cheer Thank you for your beautiful kōrero. Um, I love you talking about your, epip you know, the, the lightning bolt, the epiphany moment as an artist, where, and also how your connection to Te Taiao is a way to revitalize yourself as an artist as well. Like it, it gives to you when you connect to the environment. It is inspiring. So looking forward to talking to you more this evening, Warren. Well now I'd like to introduce our second panelist for this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce my very own cousin, Dr. Hu Hannah Smith. Hu Hana is a visual artist, curator, and principal investigator in research who engages in major environmental transdisciplinary kaupapa Māori action research projects. She has exhibited in Aotearoa, Australia, and the Pacific, and is a former senior curator of Māori at Te Papa. Hu Hana is now the head of school at Whitiore Hua School of Art at Massey University. 
and she is also undertaking research that includes Mātauranga Māori methods with sciences to actively address climate change concerns for coastal Māori lands in Horawhenua Kapiti. Kia ora huhana, welcome. Ona mihi. Nā mihi mahana ki a koe taku whananga. Um, uh, Kanui te mihi atu ki a kaitaka toa. Uh, tai mai nei ki tēnei kōrero. Um, it's an enormous honour to be here tonight and thanks so much to my cousin Delina for sorting all this out and also for Sarah Meads who we've done work with before. Um, Kanui te aroha ki a koe Warren. I, I am his master's supervisor. So we are making sure that he's doing um, well, helping him make and produce beautiful work uh, to be exemplified as his master's at Massey University. So as my cousin said, I am the head of School of Art at Massey University in Wellington. And we also have um, uh, the Toyohu Kiapiti, the Māori Visual Arts at, at the Palmerston North Campus. Um, I have been working in this field a little bit like what um, Warren was saying before. We've been working in this kind of area. He's in music, I'm in art. I've been doing it probably a little bit longer than him. But I was quite, um, I've, I've, yeah, I've probably been involved in this for, gosh, I don't want to say actually, you'll, you'll work out, you'll work out sums. But um, I've been involved in art and visual culture for some time. And then um, I probably in my, in my early 30s, I came to New Zealand, back to New Zealand. I've been in Australia and I came back to New Zealand, um, having been here when I was fir first been here when I was two and a half. My mother is the Māori connection to Ngāti Tukorehe. And I came back when I was 30 and I started my life all again um, from having an art practice and um, in Melbourne and Australia and then literally starting again and starting again in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And, and I was quite struck when I first came to New Zealand because I, I kind of thought that New Zealand was really, really, really onto it when it came to aspects environmental and that I was coming to a place that was incredibly um, ahead of everybody else. And I was a bit shocked when I came here and driving up. I remember going up to the East Coast for my first time on Ngāti Poro country and being quite shocked about there was no forest on the hills and where was the forest everyone talked about. But anyway, subsequently um, from that first kind of foray into New Zealand, and I think when my mother came to visit me, she had a she had a, um, a kind of a moment when we went down to Kuku Beach, where we're from in Kuku Hora Whenua, and she had a moment where she was quite concerned that the, the beach or the coastal environment didn't feel like it used to when she grew up there. And it kind of was a memory that really stuck in my mind. And I was, I was kind of asking her, why doesn't it feel the same, mum? And she said, it's all changed, something's changed. So I think from those moments, um, like what Warren was saying before about reconnecting with Te Thai Awa, reconnecting with the environment, um, there's so much memory and there's so much korero that our, our family and our whanau and our relations have had. Uh, it's like there's embedded memory in where they grew up and um, my mother grew up in Kuku and I grew up in an equivalent in Australia, which is a little place called Savanak in Southern New South Wales. But when mum grew up in Kuku, Kuku, Kuku was quite a Māori community and it was quite a community where people could gather food safely from river systems and, and the estuary and they could go fishing and shell fishing and they had summer harvests and they followed customary fishing practices and they everyone gardened and everyone had orchards and everyone just lived really well. And I want to say my mother is 91. She's 91. She's still with us. My father is 89. They're still with us. They're living in Australia. But the thing that the health and well-being that my the, the kind of lifestyle my mother led was a Māori lifestyle of growing your own gardens, eating your own food, um, being incredible, kind of incredibly comfortable with being that close to nature in a sense. Um, but then also there were the, the tensions and the conflicts and the, the difficulties that were coming for um, Māori, particularly in that time in the 1950s when, um, you know, economic basis had changed dramatically. Uh, there, were, there were a range of policies and crown actions and all sorts of things that made it difficult to be Māori. And, you know, my mother was actually actively encouraged to leave Kuku. 
So um, when she headed to Australia in 1956, um, that was kind of like her leaving everything behind and from a childhood that she'd had, which it was all about food growing, food gathering, close to nature, understanding place, um, you know, knowing who she was and from a Māori sense and then um, having to leave that. So when I came back in my 30s, uh, well, I was 30 when I came back to New Zealand and I was, um, I was quite blown away from that experience mum had when cuckoo didn't feel like the cuckoo she remembered as a child. And I really wanted to know why. And I think it really came down to the fact that um, from the 1970s um, to create, you know, strong economic bases for Māori, we, we, we went deeply into... Um, agriculture and we went deeply into dairying and as the kind of technologies changed and improved over time and that kind of thing we went deeply 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 into agriculture to the point where um, our coastal farm is um, you know a, a Māori asset and an economic base but it's suffering the kind of ill effects of um, industrialized ag agriculture. So if I think about from that experience of my mum feeling that cuckoo beach and the coastline and the farm, it didn't feel the same. It didn't feel, maybe um, Warren was saying before about that feeling of Modi, like not feeling that, that incredible energy that came from that place anymore made me think, well, what's wrong? So um, I started kind of getting involved a much more, and I was very environmentally minded when I was in Australia. And I, you know, I worked for the Green Party and I worked for the Green Bookshop and did all sorts of things in Melbourne and that kind of thing. So I was very green orientated. So I kind of started investigating New Zealand a bit more. And, and that's when I really, really started to ground myself within Cuckoo. In that process of grounding myself, I had to learn a lot as well because I'd been raised in Australia, so I wasn't completely acculturated in a um, an Atitukura here context. So I had to do an incredible amount of learning really quickly. In that process of learning, I really dedicated myself to understanding kaitiakitanga and what it meant to be a protector and a conservator of the natural environment. And I, I just worked, I just worked really hard. I studied really hard. Um, I still had my creative practice and I was doing the Māori visual arts at Massey in, in Palmerston North, um, which completely changed my life, um, philosophically, spiritually, visually, um, visual culture wise, and um, getting to know my relations of Ngāti Tukura here, you know, learning te reo Māori, learning to understand te reo, learning to understand um, Māori cultural precepts. I just went hard out. And I think because I was really hungry to actually find something that was different to what I'd been experiencing in Melbourne, um, but also to reconnect. And I think that's what Warren's been talking about as well, like the deep compulsion that we have to reconnect with the um, natural environment. So I did that and, um, and I've been doing that and I've been doing that in earnest with my relations from Ngāti Tukurahe um, in Kuku. Um, and so since really since 1996, we've been working really hard to try and turn around the impacts that industrialized agriculture is having on our tribal farm, because it is a, it is highly significant ancestral landscape and it's full of all the stories of our relationship to place. I mean, we did from the mountains to sea, we used to own all of it. And now we really own mainly the, coast, um, the coastal strip um, but so many stories abounded, so many memories, so many komatua um, uh, relationships, so many sustainable food gathering practices that our people knew. Um, I, I, I dedicated myself to knowing um, a lot more about what were those things that they did to sustain themselves and to maintain culture through a deep relationship with Te Tai Ao. So that's, that's pretty much what I've been doing since I've been back in New Zealand. Um, so um, from the, the kind of work that we were doing from 1996, we've done, um, and I, I, I talk about, it's a we thing, it's never an I thing, it's a we thing we've done, um, my cousins and I, and uncles and aunties, we've done so much work in Kuku to try and turn around um, the problems that we've had with freshwater, and we've done an incredible amount of work in wetlands, 
and we've been revegetating wetlands since um, 18 years of wetland forest growing now. Um, we've been working on an area called the Orho Loop um, in the area between, so if I need to just locate people where it is, it's in Horofenua and it's between Lavan and Ōtaki and we are a community, Kuku is a community um, between Oho and Manako, and then um, out at Kuku Oho Estuary and towards the Taradua Mountains, that is our that is our rohe. And we're between the Oho River and the Waikawa River. But that area, um, my cousins and I have been focusing on, on every single little piece, every stream, every wetland, every river bend, every We've just been trying to move our, ourselves from the sea right forward to the mountains um, to actually return health to those areas. So there's been an um, incredible amount of work done um, over many years now. So it's a good couple of decades we've been working on, on this um, work. So a lot of it was about water and a lot of it was about protecting cultural landscape and a lot of it was about maintaining our cultural heritage and a lot of it was about, I have a message from our sponsor at the moment. It says, you can cook broccoli or you just wilt the spinach on top of your servings back about 9.45. Thanks, Lynn. Lynn's going off to bed. Lynn. <laughs> That's dinner getting cooked. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> Can I turn it all off? Oh, I yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. I'll put them in the rice up while I turn the curry up as well. Cup of, yep, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so look, where we, where we are now, so we've done a lot of revitalization work around wetlands. We've done a lot of revitalization work around rivers. Um, we've done a lot of revitalization work about around water and water health. Um, but what we're kind of working on now, so probably since 2015, we've been working hard out on climate change because not only is it water and the impacts that have happened to water for our people, um, it's also, and the loss of Modi and the loss of biodiversity and all the things that they held so dear, it's also that we've got all these other conflicting vulnerabilities that are coming through storm, storm surges, um, more extreme weather, extreme flooding, um, coastal erosion, uh, we're getting groundwater inundation, and um, we've been, so since 2015, we've been spending time working with our iwi and hapu. Um, and I just want to just kind of talk very briefly. I mean, I could talk a lot. I did talk a lot. I talked for an hour last night at the Govett Brewster in New Plymouth and had the best conversation with a whole range of people there. But I just want to talk to this group and to whoever who's listening out there is that the way that we do our research projects is that everything has to be grounded in cultural context. So anyone who wants to play in our research projects, and we do big interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research projects, you have to come to the marae of Ngāti Tupkura here, and you have to start your journey there before you can go out on the whenua or go out on the land and work um, in, our, in our region. Um, so um, I have worked with many, many people. My cousins, um, particularly Aroha Spinks and Moira Potama, we called ourselves the Kayuta Collective, and we also expanded that out to include other specialists who came into that nexus. But we're a group of people and, um, you know, grounded to quarter hair people who are committed to making change on the ground. So... Whenever we engage in big research projects, people have to come to the marae. So that's what's happening tomorrow. We've got, I've got a, I was looking out the window before, we've got um, a tuna and inanga specialist. So we've got a white bait and a eel specialist coming to stay tonight. And then we've got a, and I think they've just started to roll up. But anyway, I won't leave. I'll keep talking here, but they're starting to roll up. Um, and we've got a groundwater specialist coming. Now these are, people who know um, inanga and tuna and they know groundwater really well and they're coming to help us. They're coming to come into our vessel. This is our Māori vessel. We create, we create a kete, a basket, and then we fill it with all the right people who should be in that conversation. So those guys are coming um, to help us tomorrow when we start talking about um, manaki in a taonga i tukua mai e ngā tūpuna and we are basically investigating action oriented climate change transitions to water-based land uses that enhance Tonga species. 
So essentially what we're saying, based on the knowledge of our ancestors or our elders or our kaumata or our great grandparents, our grandparents, our great grandparents and those before us, is that we need to return to um, enhancing Tonga species because we're getting wetter on our, wet on our west coast. So um, Warren on his coast is going to get drier and we're going to get wetter. And so what we have to do is we need to adapt to that water. And, and we, um, in, in very multiple, very complex ways, um, what we also have to do is adapt um, uh, our economies. So if we are farming, there are things that we're not going to be able to do anymore because it's going to be too wet. And this could happen within 20 years. So it's not very far away. So it could, it's happening now and it could happen um, 10, 20, in a hundred years, it may not look at anything like it is today if we don't make active changes now. And I think that's what I talked about last night at the Gavit Brewster, like how important art, visual culture, design, Māori knowledge systems, how do you visualise these things? How do you make it happen in Fenua? How do you activate projects? How do you bring the best experts together into that vessel and make them all work together as one? That's all I focus on now, and that's all what our research projects are about. So we've got so many cumulative changes with climate change. We've got so many likely changes, increased inundation, the duration of water dura, um, inundation, the frequency, the intensity of flooding, changing surface and groundwater levels. We've got all these things, but how might we transition from an agricultural land-based um, to a more water-based land use is what we are exploring on the west coast of um, the Kuku Horofenua coastline. And we will use it by, um, we will use it and we will do this by activating research methodologies which are based on, again, the vessel coming together, the teams of people walking and talking on Whenua. We do a lot of hikoi. Um, we do a lot of philosophical thinking about how everything is whakapapa related or genealogically related. So everything that we deal to is interdependent and interrelated and that we rely on kore or tuku iho or the knowledge of place to inform the research that we're doing. So we can bring all those fabulous, amazing knowledge people who think about things in a very, very global, you said that before too, Warren, that, you know, that real global sense. But COVID has given us a blessing of sit down humans and get your local area sorted. So I am totally what you were saying about how do we link up? And like last night, I put the, I put the wet all out to, you know, Taranaki Whanui and Ngāti Te Whiti. And I said, from Wellington, like Te Whanganui Atara to, to up to New Plymouth, let's link up the whole West Coastline. And every iwi and hapu group on that coastline creates a vessel in which to receive a hell of a lot of people coming together to sort the difficulties and the complexities that we are facing now. And that if we're going to resource these things, we need to be art, music, design, visual culture, all ways of harnessing complexity and showing people that we can do it through these, these mediums is what we have to do. So I'm committed. So anyone else who wants to play with us, we have a lot of fun. Woohoo! It's all about fun. Um, it's because otherwise you just get really depressed because it's really scary at the same time. But you just focus on what can really creative people do. All right. Well, so no, I, I've, um, I've followed your work on the coast and I know it's taken up a persistence on your part for many many years bringing people weaving uh, people together knowledge systems and also deep back reconnection with with the land and and um, kaitiake tangi um, and it's interesting that you bring up that same thing of going local at a time when we've got these big global issues happening but that connection is important just to focus as well on 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 your own land and your own peoples so thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm sure there's some places that people can go. Maybe we um, mention resources at the end if you're interested in finding out more about the wonderful work that you're doing at Google. Next, I'd like to introduce um, our next panelist, 
Linda Chanwei Earl. Linda is a Chinese New Zealander with a background in the arts and public broadcasting. She's a founding presenter of Radio New Zealand's Voices program and her award-winning poetry and plays have been published, produced and toured in national festivals and abroad. She has been awarded the prestigious 2019 Writer in Residence at the International Institute of Modern Letters at Victoria University of Wellington. Letters Home was her first authentic New Zealand Chinese play and set in Antarctica, Linda's award-winning green-powered play Heat toured New Zealand and Whole follows and will premiere at Circa Theatre Wellington this month, very soon. So welcome, Linda. <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora, everybody. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, um, Delina and um, Sarah. I really appreciate, um, really appreciate uh, the privilege of being here and sharing our, our mahi uh, and just um, want to tautoku, um, Warren and um, Huhana, your work, your beautiful, awesome work. I've been a huge fan of Warren's music for the last two decades and Huhana, I just I would love to come and play on your... Right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm down here in um, Te Whanganui Atara. Um, my coast is uh, south coast, Ofiro Bay. I'm just uh, very close to Ofiro Bay. Um, but I came from, let me think, um, born in London, grew up in Papua New Guinea, uh, travelled extensively as a child through Southeast Asia and then came back to New Zealand uh, because both my parents are New Zealanders and um, my mum being Chinese and my dad being Pākehā. Um, and my Chinese side of the family being here longer than the Pākehā, I think, or as long, about five generations. Um, so I'm a Poltax descendant. Um, yeah, there's a lot that when you talk about family and uh, whakapapa, you know, that's my, <laughs> that's my complex <laughs> um, um, history, my genealogy. Um, so yeah, Poltax descendants um, and um, also growing up and having a chance to travel through um, so much of the Pacific and Melanesia and Southeast Asia and just within my lifetime noticing um, going back to places like Fiji or um, um, places overseas and, and, and going back into the water and noticing the um, really heartbreaking um, destruction of our beautiful planet um, so um and even just on the, i'm so thankful that we have now made a fedo bay a marine reserve um right round um the south coast um because i used to go um, um about 20 years ago i used to live um right here on the coast and um go fishing you know, go do a little bit of um, uh, um, spearfishing and catch a bit of um, kaimoana, but um, within that time um, saw how the whole coast was being raped and pillaged and um, kind of broken hearted about that. So I'm really, really glad that we have these, um, these in place. Um, I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna see if this is going, um, here we go. Um, Ed, Edward might be able to help me out. <laughs> uh, so I've got my um, in the top window uh, up here. Oh yes, here we go. Lovely. Right. Cool. Um, so I just need to go into the top window and get me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sorry about this guys, Be bear with me, um, yeah, um, I can't, yeah, no, I've got the, I've got the, um, the well, anyway, look, I'll tell you what, <laughs> while I work out how to do this, um, so Antarctica is, has been huge for me as well, um, Warren, and I, um, I first fell in love with Antarctica, Back in 1997, when my um, my friend Chris Orsman was one of the inaugural fellows to Antarctica, and um, I was doing my solo show, Gasu Letters Home, 
um, about New Zealand Chinese history um, at the Christchurch Arts Festival. And, and um, I remember bumping into um, Chris and dragging him into a rehearsal, <laughs> a solo show. So it was just me and him um, sitting there watching me. Um, and he, I remember him saying, oh, I'm off to Antarctica. Um, you should think about that um, fellowship. And I was like, oh, what do I want to go to Antarctica for? <laughs> and then he, that planted the seed. And ever since then, it's just been in my imagination big time. Behind me is the um, poster for Heat. Um, and so we actually use the real equipment from uh, Antarctica, New Zealand, um, the real um, clothing and um, quite a few of the props. Um, and we did green power it. So we were mad enough to try and, um, and completely um, power off the grid um, with solar panels and wind turbine. Um, and Marcus McShane was, uh, is our lighting designer and alternative energy designer. Um, uh, and it's, it's been a really wonderful team uh, that I've gathered again for uh, the second um, part of my Antarctic Trilogy um, whole. And, um, and I've gathered the same team, um, David O'Donnell's directing, um, Gareth Farr is composing the music, and Gareth also was a... Um, Antarctic Fellow in 2005. Um, but why did I fall in love with Antarctica? Because I imagined, um, so my trilogy, Heat, Hole and Heart, explores uh, and, and speaks to climate change, but it goes back in time. So um, if I start with heat, it's a love-hate triangle between a uh, a man, a woman, and a penguin, an emperor penguin, played by a naked, body-painted male actor on stage um, throughout. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll just see if I can try and get those. Uh, no. Yes. Yeah, um, no, I haven't, I can't see, oh, hang on. Lindsay, can you pop it onto the gallery view? Oh, here we go, presentation. You awesome. Yep, have I got it now? Have I got it now, guys? Yes, we can see it there. Cool, okay, you've got the first one, haven't you? So let me see if I can move through it. Ah, oh, here we go. Yay, so I'm doing it now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's, um, this is whole, that's, and the um, image in it is actually from um, my beautiful friend Lillian Ng. Um, uh, she was wintering over, she spent 14 months on the ice um, at the Halley base uh, as a sole medical officer, and she took these extraordinary photographs. So they're behind all of my um, Antarctic images um, that are in the um, graphics. But uh, long story short, heat whole heart, so heat's a love triangle between a man, a woman, and a penguin, um, and um, it's, these are all based on real true stories, real life stories, believe it or not, because there was a, a husband and wife that wintered over, and um, so it's set in the endless darkness. Why did we want to alternatively power it? Um, because it was a challenge um, set by um, BATS Theatre um, with the STAB Festival um, to be technically innovative. And um, we wanted to mimic the conditions inside a, um, a, here we go. We wanted to mimic the conditions of the, the these are the actors, sorry, for Hole. And we'll come back to Hole in a second, but here's Heat. Um, and we wanted to mimic the conditions inside an Antarctic hut if you were marooned on the Ross Ice Shelf um, throughout winter, um, through the endless darkness. And um, so we decided then to, Marcus McShane challenged us to be totally green. Um, we went um, for solar panels and wind turbine and everywhere that the play went around the country um, within theatre venues, it was powered off the grid, green powered, eco powered. And um, it was just, it was a really, so what you're looking at now, uh, um, that all of that lighting, specially designed LED lights um, by Marcus, um, low drain, etc. cetera, um, just, um, and if, if you like, what I try to do with my stories is, um, is 
is, is talk to or speak to climate change issues without sort of, um, but, but draw people into the actual drama, the real hu the human, the real life drama, the human frailties um, and um, set on the ice. So um, this is um, Kate Pryor and, um, and Simon Vincent playing the husband and wife scientist team who are um, going mad in the total darkness maroon fear with this emperor penguin that's entered their lives, Bob the emperor penguin. Um, the, um, here's the, the energy. So we toured it with the solar panels, wind turbine, every um, venue we went to. And um, that's the alternative energy inside um, the, uh, the, the container. So everywhere that um, it went, where there's a parked outside um, Circa Theatre, we were able to um, open it up as a kind of exhibition space so um, people could see, read up on um, Antarctica and, 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 um, and some of the issues. And that was back in 2008 through to 2011 we toured heat and now we're on to um, with um, on to hole oh, I'll come back to that um, we're on to hole and um, the um, next installment <laughs> um, heart uh, so hole is set when the ozone hole was discovered it's the wild west days of Antarctica um, again it's a three-hander um, uh, that's three actors, um, but instead of two men and one woman, it is two women and one man, and that's uh, Sipulini Mo'o playing um, a US Navy SEAL, um, and, um, and our beautiful Elle um, Wooten playing um, a New Zealand scientist, Stella. Um, who is, um, is, is trying to research um, following Susan Solomon, the real life Susan Solomon's um, research into atmospheric, um, uh, atmospheric um, science. And um, she was, Susan Solomon has actually been helping re me with my research and my writing. And so has Mae Ma DePorta, um, who's a Greenpeace activist. Um, this is a homage really to the women as well, um, real life women who have shaped um, our world history. So um, Susan Solomon, uh, her research helped bring about the Montreal Protocol um, and, um, and that was the first time that all governments across the world banned, if you remember going, thinking back to the ozone hole, when it was discovered, um, people didn't quite know what was causing it and, and they figured it was um, uh, chlorofluorocarbon CFCs um, and that was Susan's um, research um, and she was down in Antarctica <laughs> to do that um, and if, if it wasn't for that research, the Montre Montreal Protocol, then um, CFCs wouldn't have been banned. And, and, and if, if anything, for me, it's like, how can I explore these stories? Um, uh, and, and May the Porter was one of the expedition leaders um, with Greenpeace setting up World Park Base. So this is wild west days of Antarctica um, in the mid 80s. Um, not long after the Rainbow Warrior was sunk. Um, and um, so uh, the, the character Bonnie um, is based on, that's played by Stevie Hancock's Monk. Um, and the character Bonnie is um, based on Made the Porter's character. So we, we have this kind of love-hate triangle again, um, a clash between Greenpeace activists and uh, the US Navy. Um, a Navy SEAL um, who happens to be American Samoan um, and we um, look at all of the issues that are facing, um, uh, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is during a prolific nuclear testing through, the, and remember the um, Rainbow Warrior was sunk because it had been um, uh, protesting against um, nuclear testing in the Pacific. Um, so MV Greenpeace um, was the boat that replaced the Rainbow Warrior and went down to Antarctica. Um, so for me, Hull is, is, it's just been a really beautiful um, coming together again of the Fano, the, the, um, the same team and more that created heat. Um, and um, again, we're gonna be green powering it um, and 
we're really wanting to encourage. Um, I mean, the, the thing is that e every single show is green powered and draws less power than 10% of one household compared to a normal theatre show that would have halogen lights and all the rest of it, which would burn up huge amounts of power. So we're trying to, I guess, encourage um, encourage our audience, our theatres and our theatre industry and the arts industry to think about um, power saving. <laughs> We're actually on a power budget as well. We have to be careful not to use too much power, um, especially um, when we were on tour. Um, if we were down in the Otago Arts Festival, um, you know, we might <laughs> burn through. If there wasn't enough light and a sunlight and enough um, wind, then we would have burnt through our power very quickly. Um, but that, that all of that was just really wonderfully challenging for us. Um, and so Whole is following suit. Uh, and the third play in the Antarctic trilogy is Heart. Um, Heart is, if you think back to when um, Hillary's Little Red Tractor was on the ice in Antarctica, and also when they were um, digging down taking the very first ice core samples to test for, um, to, to look at the very early conversations around climate change and, um, and, and um, noting um, carbon dioxide within those, those ice cores um, and also testing the snow for radiation because of the prolific um, nuclear testing um, uh, around the Pacific. And um, so that's the late 50s. And, It'll be another three-hander. I'm still researching and um, writing Heart, but Hole's about to premiere. And Heart um, will be a three-hander, but this time all women playing the male characters. Um, so it's been in, it's been an incredible privilege, especially during these really um, fraught times with the pandemic, with um, with the lockdowns. It's just been an absolute privilege to be able to gather the team and to work where we're going to be presenting whole um, with in, in a safe environment with um, in circa one with a hundred people spaced out in seating. Um, so there's that, that safety there. Um, but it's, yeah, just in these times, it's so important to be able to gather our Fano back together to, um, to, speak to these um, issues but do it in a way that um, hopefully will um, make uh, our audience fall in love with our characters um, and yeah with I'm just yeah I'm so excited <laughs> sorry, sorry I've just had this big rant <laughs> um, I think um, yeah what else um, for me um, um, actually, I will go straight to the end of my slideshow because um, it's almost like I'm going backwards. But um, there's my first play, Gusu Letters Home. That's my mother collecting tohoros of Fox, Foxton Beach. She was about the age of six when it was still legal to collect tohoro. Um, you know, seafood is Kaimoana is huge with our Asian communities, but it's also really important to educate not to um, overfish and to, you know, to deplete our resources. Um, so this is my, that's um, Gusu Letters Home was published in the end. Um, but yeah, exploring lots of, um, um, of New Zealand Chinese history, um, exploring that the last hundred years of New Zealand and China's um, uh, you know, this one immigrant family drama um, based very really close to the bone on um, my own family, um, you know, um, surviving um, the Sino-Japanese invasion, my mother being a refugee and, and so on as a baby coming to New Zealand um, to join the, um, the, my great-grandfather and my grandfather here. Um, and um, I'm, I'm talking about the the state of refugees because this relates to so much of my um, work and my writing um, man in a suitcase again um, uh, based on um, a murder of a, a, a Chinese student but also um, I fictionalized it and had a character 
um, who was a survivor uh, of Myanmar, um, a, a Karen um, refugee from um, the Karen ethnic state. This is um, beautiful Caitlin Wong performing the character Koki Poor. And why refugees? Because um, we are going to be experiencing our very first um, wave of environmental refugees throughout the Pacific from our Pacifica nations and also because of the sea level rises is, uh, is going to affect our um, ultimately affect our um, communities living on the coast um, <laughs> including me but um, you know I'm thinking about our um, rural um, uh, our coastal um, Maori communities and so on who, who are going to be the most hardest hit and this is you know who are gonna, um, to what you were saying who, if we we need to be acting now we need to be um, proactive and seeking yeah. solutions wherever we can um and yeah that's me <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's I, I just want to add i live in island bay just around the corner from hospital so i think we need to meet at the oh yeah. the, chaos or the beach chaos for a coffee yes yeah. please and well, i'd love that i'd love that sounds yeah. wonderful thank you linda and really important that you highlight that point about environmental refugees that has yes. come up Point has come up in the previous panel as well, just talking about the impact of sea level rise. Also, mm -hmm. just want to acknowledge you for the incredible amount of research that goes into your productions, mm -hmm. um, and that not only are you exploring stories and sharing stories about climate change, but you're also literally, it's very inspiring how you're creating green energy to power, literally power the productions that you put on. So just want to acknowledge you and your team for that amazing mahi. Thank you, thank you, Delina. And now I'd like to introduce our final panelist for this evening, Rob Ruha. Rob is an iconic Māori music artist and leads new generations in sonic and performance expressions of their Indigenous lineage, spiritual intellect, tikanga, te reo, and environmental connectivity. Rob creates powerful music that weaves Māori poetry, faith, and ancestry with tribal R&B interpretations, fresh summer soul, and funk, that has something to say. Rob Ruha and his band, The Witch Doctor, magnetize Māori music, drawing together people with their pocket tunes and real speak messages. Rob is the recipient of an Arts Laureate, has won TUIs at New Zealand Music Awards for Best Māori Album, Māori Songwriter, Song and Male Solo Artist, and has also won the prestigious APRA Maioha War Award twice. Rob sees music as a powerful tool in the face of adversity, and it's wonderful to have you on our panel tonight. Kia ora, Rob. Uh, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, Dalina, tēnā no hoki koe, uh, Sarah, uh, mō, mō te pōhiri ki a haramai a wahau ki koni, uh, ki tēnei hui hui ngō tātou, uh, e te iwi tēnā koutou, uh, me ki pēnei uh, ko tauranga, uh, ko tawhitinui te maunga, ko tauranga te awa, uh, ko te whānau a pararaki te hapu, ko te whānau a panui te iwi. Uh, te tātaku māma, ko pātangata te maunga, ko uh, waikohu te awa, ko te whānau a tūwhakairi ora te hapu, ko Ngāti Pro te iwi. A tēne ka mihi atu ki a koe te katoa. Oia no, uh, no kei roto anō hoki awa, uh, wetahi whakapapa ki a koe te o Ngāti Raukawa, uh, Ngāti Kauwhata anō hoki, tainu e waka, uh, ahu atu ki roto te aroa waka, uh, tainu ki roto uh, Ngāti Tūwhare toa, rongo whakāta, ngā, Ngāri ki kai putahi, a uh, tainu ki te tai tōpere. Nā re re, mihi ana ki a koutou katoa tēnā koutou. Uh, Iaku hoa po whiwhinga uh, i tēnei po, tēnei anō hoki ka mihi ki a koutou, me te hira hira anō hoki o ngā kaupapa kairoto i a koutou. Uh, just, uh, um, it's like, what do I say after that? <laughs> that was just... Um, um, some amazing, um, amazing kōrero uh, and amazing kaupapa that um, have been shared uh, this evening uh, mō te tai te take. Um, but uh, I'm just a humble coasty boy, born and bred on the, on the East Coast. Um, my family of uh, five tamariki and my wife also uh, live here in, um, in Te Kahanui Atiki uh, in Te Whānau Apanui, uh, which is my dad's whānau. My dad's iwi, uh, but I was brought up in a little place called Hicks Bay or Farikahika. We knew it as Farikahika. 
uh, brought up on a farm. And, um, you know, some of the stories that we heard um, this evening about, um, I think, uh, Huhana, your, your mama, how she was brought up, you know, <clears throat> big, huge gardens, orchards everywhere, uh, get kai from the sea, get kai from the land. Uh, that's how we were brought up too. I used to hate blinking gardens <laughs> because our gardens were huge. Um, and they were like, uh, we, had, we had five gardens that were like the size of a football field um, um, and it's really funny because um, I don't remember any of the food going to waste hey, it was a huge thing that um, when you put down a garden you didn't put down a garden just for yourself or for your own family or for your nuclear family hey, it's for everyone hey, so yeah you just imagine <laughs> five football fields full of food um, potatoes, kumara, uh, watermelon, um, you name it, that we grew it. Um, and also we were on a farm, uh, so we had uh, kai galore and our farm was right on the sea. Um, so growing up, we also learnt um, tides, we learnt where, um, where the blind eel rocks were, where the snapper rocks were, where the powers were, and then all the the families um, in the little village that we grew up in, they had their own channels um, and everyone knew those channels and, and no one um, took from those channels if you didn't need to. Uh, back in back when I was growing up, um, you know, diving and fishing, huge thing. And you only and you only went diving in the season. You never went diving out of season when I when I was growing up. And so Everyone used to be starving for kinners all through the all through the year, and then um, but everyone knew the signs. So you'd wait for either the kōhai to bloom uh, or the kōtukutuku to bloom first, and then you know, knew the the kinners were coming on, and then you waited for the pōhutukawa to bloom. And when the when the pōhutukawa were in bloom, that's when you knew the kinner were fat, um, and they would only be fat if the pohutukawa bloomed on the side of the sea. Um, so all of these things we grew up with. We grew up with um, uh, going into all of our aunties and uncles' uh, orchards and raiding their peaches and raiding their uh, fijoas and all those kind of beautiful things, the wicked plums from um, my auntie Mickey's place. And um, so, uh, and summertimes, summertimes we always spent at the river. Uh, I can remember being dropped off and never picked up. <laughs> um, and having five kids of my own now, it's something that um, I, I wouldn't even kind of dare to do. Um, but um, that's how we grew up. And we grew up um, knowing um, how to read the water, how to read um, currents. Um, and then we grew up knowing that probably in about half an hour's time, an uncle was going to show up and they'd probably have the leftover KFC from town. Or uh, they would have, you know, had some kai with them. And sure enough, that's, what it, that's exactly what happened. Um, so so what's, what's the point of all of this, Kōrero? Um, now living back on the coast uh, and raising mine and my wife's uh, five tamariki back here, it's all what that was all about growing up was making us fall in love uh, um, with ourselves, really, because um, as Māori, you learn that the environment is you. You are a part of it. It's not something external to you. It's not an agency somewhere else that's foreign to you. Uh, and, you know, as I did tonight, um, the indigenous way or the Maori way of introducing yourself is through your mountain and then your river and then everything else after that. Hey, so um, growing up, uh, raiding all up my aunties and uncles' uh, fruit trees and then, and uh, <clears throat> doing the football fields full of uh, full of gardens, uh, that taught us to fall in love with our environment. And so uh, a huge part of moving back home. Uh, after living all over the show, Auckland, Rotorua, Gisborne, Hawaii, um, it was about that. It was um, identity, was teaching our kids about identity and environment are one and the same thing. Uh, and, and to fall in love with your identity is to fall in love with your environment. 
And when it comes to things like uh, reckless government policy around deep sea oil drilling, there's um, no hesitation um, uh, when it comes to picking a side. When it comes to um, drawing a line in the sand, there's no hesitation because you've already fallen in love with the sea. You've already fallen in love with the boo-boos that you like um, getting out the front of the church. And you've already fallen in love with going to Te Haroto to get, um, to get your, your kina or to Papatea to go and get your tuna or um, around uh, Tihiro to go and uh, get... Uh, get your crabs so that you go and can go out uh, moki fishing. Um, you've already fallen in love with those things. It's a no brainer. You would stand up and, um, and push back uh, at, rec at reckless, um, reckless decision making that um, would destroy any part of that, um, that environment. Um, so that's why, that's why we're home. Um, and then the mahi that I do in my music, um, I've been writing songs since I can remember. Um, and predominantly uh, in Te Māori, because um, well, that's my first language, um, and writing songs that encourage, um, encourage identity and grow identity and grow uh, inspiration from identity. Uh, because as I said before, in identity, is <clears throat> identity is environment. We are a part of the environment through who we are through our whakapapa and through um, things like pepeha that connect us there all the time, keep us connected, keep us grounded. Um, I just recently come back from uh, Tolaga Bay, from Uawa, and um, I don't know if you've been following stuff that's been happening in Uawa, but there's been a couple of huge downfalls of rain here. Uh, on the coast just recently and a whole heap of slashes washed down the rivers and then ended up in the beaches um, over there in Tolaga Bay. It's huge. Uh, and um, the forestry companies at, at the moment have uh, kind of like nice and tidily piled everything up on, on the beach. <clears throat> the locals, locals in Tolaga Bay are now calling it 90 pile beach because um, <clears throat> there's like massive piles of uh, of uh, water all over, all over the place. And, but the, the unfortunate thing is um, the piles on the beach of, of pine is those are the things that you can see. The rest are, uh, have completely smashed all the kaimoana beds, um, have um, clogged up the river mouths uh, and are still floating down um, downstream as we speak. Um, but I've just come from, from Uawa and that's after a little bit of a wānanga uh, with one of our hapus, for one of our hapus to find a, a pararaki. Um, <clears throat> and uh, while we were there, we were talking about, um, we were talking about art, we were talking about music, and we were talking about um, how it informs identity and then connectivity and all those kind of things. Um, and one thing that stood out was um, Wayne Ngata was talking about um, a writing by Captain Cook and was an observation that he made <clears throat> when his crew first landed in, in Uawa at the time. And he observed that there was massive gardens everywhere, um, that the people were in a strong, healthy state, and there was art everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> and the observation made that there was art everywhere, that was kind of the metric uh, that was used then and even now uh, that the people were in, in a state of oranga, a good state of oranga, because if you're not cleaning up rivers and if you're not um, fighting pollution and if you're not uh, doing this, that and the other, then obviously you've got wicked, wicked amount of time to create heaps of art. <clears throat> so um, coming away from... Um, Coming away from that wānanga was awesome with that, that metric in mind. Uh, when we think of uh, uh, oranga for our hapu, oranga, oranga for our people, it's those things. How, uh, how are we engaged um, with our natural environment around us? Um, how um, are we providing for each other through that engagement? Uh, and then how... Um, are our arts supporting 
uh, visionary movements uh, beyond that state to next states to next levels and encouraging um, conversation and con connectivity uh, and the, the, the promotion of oranga that we have enjoyed through our arts. Um, and I pick up the point um, that has been uh, raised about coastal whanaus, coastal peoples, um, having to really think about and rethink um, their world. We're in, we're in that um, situation in Tfano Apararaki. If you've seen the movie Boy um, by uh, our relation Taika Waititi, um, the marae that's on, on Boy, that's our marae. Um, Pararaki in, in a place called Raukokore. Um, and if you stood on the veranda of our marae, you, you can throw a stone and hit the water. Um, and that's how close the beach is. Um, and we know that probably in the next um, 10 to 25 years that we're going to have to move that marae. Okay. So the questions are now being asked, what kind of a state are our people in at the moment to be able to action that? Okay. Meaning, uh, what have we clawed back through uh, colonization to strengthen ourselves as people? Okay. What is our... Um, our relationship with our taia, with the people around us and with the, with the world around us. Uh, and are we in a state, are we actually acknowledging that that's a real thing that we're going to have to do is lift up the path that our people built around about 100 to uh, 70 to 100 years ago uh, and shift it somewhere else eh? because of the reckless uh, things that we've been doing in our lifetimes and our, in our generations. And then the other question is, and what are we going to do about that? Are we going to will that on to our mokopuna? Are we going to will that on to our tamariki? Uh, another uh, issue that's going on here in our backyard in Te Whanuapunui is the collapse of the Raukumara. Um, and the Raukumara, sections of the Raukumara are dead. They're not in collapse, they're dead. Um, and it's a very, it's a very huge take for us here in Te Whanau Apunui because Raukumara Kiuta and Raukumara Kitai, uh, the, what's happening in our forest is impacting what's happening out at the sea. Um, our little hapu of Te Whanau Apararaki is known for its bubu, hey, for the bubus on the rocks. And the bubus used to be about that big, apparently. Hey, growing up, people, our whanau growing up here, uh, and now you're lucky to get them in a marble size, hey, if at all. Uh, and that's due to the collapse um, and a lot of what's happening in the collapse of the Raukumara. Um, and so I guess uh, with my work, with uh, what I do as a, as a songwriter, is I focus my energy on what I think is the core um, glue maker and what is the core um, uh, uh, energy pack, I guess, and that is uh, around uh, identity. Koina taku mahi. Kia ora, son. Kia ora. Nā reira, tēnē rā ka mihi atu ki a koutou. Nā mihi nui. Rob, thank you so much. That was a privilege to hear how you work and how you weave um, your contribution to your community and work with the community, um, your generations and the family and around you, and then weave it back through your work as a songwriter, your glue maker, energy pack, that uh, sense of identity back to environment is really, really inspiring. So thank you so much. I've got a question um, that I wondered um, all of you may like to ask, and that is, if you're not an artist, um, hearing people talk about how arts is just part of them and you can't separate these things out, um, how is it that you can talk to people who are not artists um, about how you feel and how you want you see art expressing um, things around us that are important, like the environment? Um, we, um, in our hapu, we kind of, we just flip the language, eh? Because everything is art, really. Eh? Uh, I, can't, I can't make a sponge cake like my Auntie Queenie. 
Hey, I think that's pure art. Uh, I can't I can't do a straight fence line like my uncles. That's pure art. Hey, and uh, and the other things of of you know components of art being transformational, uh, and then um, offering uh, opportunity for people to transcend. I think I think just um, flipping the flipping the language so that everyone has kind of a space and and is allowed an opportunity to yeah occupy a creative space. Hey. And if you want to use the label artistic, oh well, kapai tera. But if it's if it's more encompassing to use creativity as what we've done in our hapu, then I I think I think that's yeah that works well for us anyway. Yeah, kia ora. Well, I, I want to add to that too. My brother's um, thinking of art as uh, solutions, solving solutions. You know, it's it's all about problem solving, and it's that's why it's so integral to who we are. As, you know. Uh, part of the dial, so uh, yeah, we've we've created these these huge challenges, but, but um, like you're saying, yeah, well, you know, flipping it and and actually valuing art as a as a, a problem solver as part of the solution, you know, allowing ourselves to um, think innovatively and creatively, uh, and be open instead of narrow minded. This is the status quo, yeah, which is happening. It's totally happening, yeah. Uh, but I think it's, um, you know, we've been sort of corrupted uh, in so many ways for, I guess, the industrial era. We don't, we don't have time to get into the capitalist side of things, but, um, you know, we are makers. You know, all, all cultures, humanity, we are makers. So, uh, yeah, that'd be my response to that. We are all artists, yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree totally with you, Warren and, and Rob. Um, we are all makers. And... I think there's been this um, kind of unfortunate, um, and, it, and it stems out of, um, I, dare I say, colonialism, post, you know, post-colonialism and institutionalized kind of the, the embedded expectations of role play of, you know, um, and the hierarchy, this, this weird assumed hierarchy. If you, if you are, um, uh, um, you have to collect the garbage or something. You're not as good as that person who wears a suit. And you know what I mean? Um, and and uh, one of the one of the most valuable lessons I learned when I was um, touring um, about 20 years ago, um, 25 years ago, with um, Taraka Hua or Tawal Tapu around um, around schools and around um, and, and working inside prisons, um, helping tell people inside prisons to tell their stories. Um, with uh, Taraka group with um, Jim Moriarty's direction one of the most valuable lessons I learned back then was that there were no stars we were all stars um, <laughs> and the, the inside the prison the person that would bring the cup of tea um, she was just as important as the person who was um, one of the women who was was performing mm -hmm. um, and there, there's I mean that that's 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 huge and I also think everybody has a story to tell um that's that's you know art art is is embedded in life and we are mm. we are it's no better or you know there isn't this if we get rid of that hierarchical thinking mm. um and and we just um see everybody um on the same in, in this big circle um mm. i think that's yeah. yeah and and when i whenever i meet somebody i always think it doesn't matter what they do i think yeah. or who, who they are where they come from yeah. you rob you know can we to me i i i but i i mean we're we're really dear friends with graham atkins and mark atkins at, at um at Tikapa and the, the Mahi and you know we know Tenanata, we know the Fano up there and just what what we're dealing with is like so heartbreaking and um, you know and that's what we're constantly doing in this space is it's an incredibly we're just dealing with so much damage and then what what can we do because we know what art does for us personally and what it does for us, you know, for our own modi, for our own spirituality, for our own sense of self, of our own sense of well-being. But how do we spread that 
to um, you know, use visual systems or ways of showing others who may not see the way that we do, but we've got facilities and we've got haptic tools and we can create images or, or sounds or help people perceive things in a different way. But when I, when I work with these groups of specialists, they're all artists. They're all, like you say, they're all creative people creating and imagining spaces, whether it be through data and digital or um, you know, data that feeds information about groundwater that we can't see. So we all have to use our imaginations about what does that water look like underneath the, underneath the ground? And why is it so important within climate change and that kind of stuff? And I, I hear Warren's corridor about, you know, the sounds that the, eel, the seals are making underneath the ice is a form of communication and a form of art. So, um, and I hear what you're saying, Linda, like, I mean, I just really hate hierarchy. Hierarchy is <laughs> that's the thing that's kind of messed everything up, you know, um, and we don't need to be promulgating hierarchy. We need to be promulgating how we come together. And that whakakotahi tanga has to be incredibly, um, it has to accelerate. It has to happen so much more. So, yeah, and, I, you know, bigger, wider, broader projects, I don't know. But, you know, but we come together. My my scientists have arrived, um, so they're in our fuddy now. So we have the the tuna and inanga specialist, and these are people who are coming to help us in our in our rohe to enhance the areas of natural integrity that we have remaining in our farm, where we want to create tuna and inanga, well tuna holding areas like we used to in the Kuku Stream and the air, all the things that our our great uncles or our grandparents or our parents even did, but maybe more our grandparents and how we, um, I'll be there in a minute, Dele, huh? I'll be there in a minute. Sorry, I've got to probably go and leave and look after my money fitty. But um, these people are coming to help us because there's been people up in Raglan who've been focusing down on how you can create natural ponds where you create, recreate natural integrity within a functioning farm, for example. Um, so, and how do you reinstate that economy that our tupuna engaged with and fed themselves and sustained themselves well every season? And I really take your point about seasonal stuff happening, not expecting to have it every day. And, and they are coming to help us, um, you know, implement uh, adaptations changes to the fact that we're getting wetter. So if we're getting wetter, let's, in, let's embrace that water like it used to be because basically our coast is actually trying to become a wet foot forest again because that's what it is and that's what it was um, and then what can we do to create systems that um, or create recreate the conditions that foster um, or what what things happen that might stop that revitalization so we have to kind of assess all that because we're dealing with completely agriculturally modified ancestral landscape it resonates with our stories. It has all of those memories. It has all the, it has all our burial grounds. It has all our people. Everywhere you go in Kuku, there's so much stuff. But it's just been shifted by agriculture, and now we have to shift it back. So, Ooh, Hannah, I love what you talk about the vessel. You know, and just put everything inside the vessel: the arts, the science, the yep. music, yep. Just all yep. of it inside the vessel. Yep. Yes, I would love up. Rob and Rob and Warren to come up and <laughs> get Robin in the diesel. Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. up and just I mean, Cuckoo's not far away from Wellington. Really, honestly, um, I just want a shameless plug for tomorrow too, because we're we've got the research team happening and they're here, they've arrived. So the groundwater look into the groundwater that you can't see and you have to imagine what it looks like. And then also the nitro eels um, raglan specialist is here. Um, but we've also got artists arriving on our whenua. Um, Maitani and I bought land back in 2006. So we've got them arriving on Friday afternoon. They're coming from Auckland. They're coming from Wellington. They're coming from around the Rohe. And they're coming to bring their creative juices to Kuku. And that's Te Waituhi Anuku, the Drawing Ecologies Group. So Te Waituhi Anuku are coming to ideate um, things. So yeah, hopefully um, in time, Kuku might become that just that little nexus, a little bit like what Teacup has done, like with when I think about Graham Atkins up on the East Coast and he and Makere, and they've created this absolute oasis 
of green world and Rongawa Māori and healing and because we're trying to heal the damage that happened to our people and the trauma that they suffered and then that was exacerbated in by um, completely changing the whenua. Now we've got to change it back and we've got to do it as soon as possible. So Rob, your kids, your whanau, everyone, it's just the massive whakakotahitanga and that we have to move. Kia te though, we have to move pretty quickly to get a hell of a lot of stuff um, um, embedded in whenua. So look, I'm sorry, I, I think I Still might no. have to get it and look after my manafiri because they've good time my lawa. Is that all right, Kaz? Hi. Thank you, bye. Yeah, of course. Yeah, love and blessings on all of you. Kanu te mihi aroha ki a koutou. Mihoro ana ki te rongo ki to i o koutou kōrero. Amazing to hear all your voices. I feel, again, blessed. Blessed. Kanu te mihi aroha ki a koutou. Yeah. Thank you, Rohana. I love you guys. Thank you. Love yeah. you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry about the jammer. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry about the jammer, but I'll see you later. Mwah. Love you all. Thank, thank you, Mohana. Okay. In fact, that's a good place to end, but man, we could have kept talking. So it just leaves us to say thank you so much for joining us today. Big thank you to our panelists, Warren, Huhana, Linda, and Rob. And recordings of this live streamed event will be available now to view um, on PANS and Track Zero Facebook and Auckland Live YouTube. Thank you so much to our panelists. What an amazing quarter all this evening. Thank you also to the team from Track Zero, PANS, Auckland Live, and also to our supporters, the Royal Society and The Big Idea. Thank you also to Edward, whose voice you might have heard this evening managing our tech behind the scenes. Thank you, Edward and Auckland Live. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our online live stream quarter all series Arts and Clim Climate Action will continue next Wednesday with the topic, What Have We Learned from COVID-19? So please join us again. Next week, we'll be speaking with panellist Professor Sean Hendy, scientist, author and director of Te Pūnaha Matatini, Baumu Matthew Salapu, aka Anonymous, and Norma Seal Faumu from 37 Hertz, who both work in music composition, media and community arts advocacy. Writer and theatre maker Joe Randerson from Barbarian Productions and acclaimed visual and performance artist Lisa Rehana. And before we leave this, this evening, I'll also do another shameless plug this time for Linda's play Hole. Please, if you're in the Wellington area, you get a chance to check it out. It will be at Circa Theatre in the week of 22nd to 26th of September. Thank you, Dylan. Awesome. And just to close our session today, I'll finish with a whakatauki. Toi tu te marae o tāne, toi tu te marae o tangaroa, toi tu te iwi. Nō reira, have a lovely evening. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. <laughs>